Well, it has thinned out. Kia ora koutou, uh, ko Kelly Skelton aho, ko Tamaki Paingahira aho, e Mahiana Iteropu Matahiko. So I'm Kelly Skelton, the head of digital experience at Auckland Museum. I'm really excited to be here and share with you today um, some insights from our Hei Taonga Māori audio guide. Just to give you some background. Uh, before I started at Auckland Museum, a mobile experience discovery project was undertaken, and that, that was to explore what a bring-your-own-device mobile experience for an Auckland Museum visitor might look like. And this was done in mid-2016, and from the discovery work came three projects that the museum prioritised. So we redesigned our Wi-Fi login, to include imagery and much less copy. It was just a bunch of terms and conditions, which was terrible. Uh, we created a landing page for visitors, so when they're actually at the museum, after they join the Wi-Fi, they see a page that provides on-site specific content about the exhibitions and maps. And the third project that we're going to cover off today uh, is prototyping a BYOD audio guide mobile experience. So what is an audio guide? Well, this is what Google says. And I think that's it at a really basic level. Um, what's missing is the value that an audio guide can provide. So they can really provide additional layers of storytelling by offering visitors an alternative way of exploring rich interpretive content. And in addition to that, if the content is available in other languages, they make it easy for non-English speaking um, visitors to access those stories. And what's also missing is the effort that goes into producing and rolling out an audio guide. Getting the first one out the door is actually a really big project. So let's, before we get into looking at what we, what we did at Auckland Museum, Let's take a look at a few other audio guides. And I was really fortunate to travel uh, to Australia and the United States in the past year, and I saw some really interesting examples that I'd like to share. So the first is at the National Gallery of Victoria in Australia, and they had the Dior exhibition. And there was a cost to use this audio guide, but uh, devices were provided. And it was an absolutely stunning exhibition. Um, it was packed. There were way too many people in there, though. Um, but the audio guide was really great. And, and rather than just looking at a bunch of frocks and reading labels, um, I found the audio guide made the experience much more engaging and interesting um, and provided me with insights and additional layers of content that I couldn't get just from walking around the exhibition. Um, at MoMA, which is the you guys will all know, is the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, they have an audio guide that spans across multiple galleries, and there's multiple guides within that. Uh, the guide is free, and they, but they also provide devices, so there's no charge. Uh, interestingly, it also comes as a downloadable app that you can download onto your mobile phone. And they translated it so it's available in 10 languages. But unfortunately, it didn't work. So you can see the sign says that they're all in use, but clearly they're not, because there's a bunch of them sitting on the desk. Um, they actually had issues with their software. So this really highlights the risk associated with providing de devices to visitors and running software. Then the 9-11 Memorial Museum in New York. So they've got three guides or tours. Um, they also provide devices and um, the guide is available as a download on your mobile device. It's in eight languages. But the super cool thing about this audio guide is that Robert De Niro is the narrator of the Witnessing History Tour and it was really moving, um, as is the entire museum, as you'll know if you visited. Uh, it's actually worth downloading the app and having a listen. 
and the David um, Bowie exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum in New York. So this was a touring exhibition, and this was the last stop, and the audio guide was actually provided as part of the exhibition with your ticket entry price, and if, so everybody was given one upon entry. And this really made sense for me as an experience within this exhibition. There were lots of clips of David Bowie talking and snips of his music being played um, as you were exploring the exhibition. And I went with a friend and we both really enjoyed it. We kind of did our own thing and made our own way around the exhibition. Um, and it really added so much for me. But I've spoken to others who really didn't like the audio guide being part of the experience. They, um, they visited with someone as well, but they wanted much more of a shared experience. Um, so I guess a learning here is that audio guides can be detrimental to a shared social experience. So it's a real factor for consideration when you're thinking about what problem an audio guide is going to solve for your audience and who you're targeting. And the last example is a talk I attended at uh, Museums in the Web conference in April this year in Vancouver. So this is really interesting. This is a collaborative um, project between MoMA and SF MoMA. So these two museums collaborated on the same exhibition. Uh, they focused on the same artist and they partnered with the same creative agency. So you might think that they'd end up with nearly identical audio guides. Um, well, they didn't. Uh, the audio guides each have a unique and distinctive point of view, as the interpretation was developed separately by each, each institution. So MoMA's was much more formal, it focused on the artist's work, whilst SF MoMA's was more informal and the focus there was on the personality of the artists. So what's key here is the opportunity to set a tone of voice within the audio guide, be it really fun or playful or more serious, and this is what we're going to explore more at Auckland Museum. So let's take a look at the audio guide that we piloted. It launched in February this year, and it took a long time to get on the floor. So the project had already kicked off when I started at the museum in December 2016, and it took us, from that point, 14 months to launch this. There are a whole bunch of reasons why, and we'll cover off some of these as we go through. So we ran it for four months, and it finished in June this year, and we ran it for that time frame so that we could actually do some evaluation uh, the audio guide's still on the floor and it's still being used by visitors. And our target audience was really international visitors and those who brought in their children aged between 7 and 14 and mainly um, English and Mandarin speakers and solo independent adults. It's available in English and Mandarin and there's three versions. So the adults version is either a one hour or a 30 minute guide, and the children's guide is 20 minutes, and then the number of stops reduces by the length of the tour. So essentially there's six versions in total, as, as there each is available in English and Mandarin. So we, we decided that um, we weren't going to provide devices, so visitors have to use their own device to access the guide, so it's a bring your own de device experience and it's free, so part of the pilot has actually been to evaluate whether we'll charge visitors to use audio guides. They can purchase headphones from the store for $8, and we chose a local off-the-shelf audio guide product working with Glenn Barnes and his team at Motors, Glenn, Glenn. Um, and just want to point out this was not the reason the guide took so long to roll out. The software has been really good. And we decided to use uh, the web-based app version, so visitors access the guide via our website. We didn't want to make visitors have to download an app. We promoted the guide in our daily What's On, so visitors can access it via URL or scan a QR code. And we work really closely with our visitor services team, 
just to make sure that the hosts who are interacting with our visitors were briefed on all the components of the guide so they could really help visitors out and answer any questions. And our marketing was also a really core part of the team. They made sure our internal and then also visitor facing comms were all covered. Uh, we also featured it in our Mandarin daily what's on. Um, so let's take a look at the actual guide. So visitors arrive at a landing page and just for the span of the pilot, we asked them for their email address just so we could send them a survey. And this was incentivised, so they went into the draw to win a gift hamper from the store. They then chose their language, so English or Mandarin, and the length of the guide, 30 minutes, one hour children's, and then they started the guide. So there's a menu, so where you can select stops if you want to skip forward or back, and there's also a map to show where the stops are within the gallery. And this is a view of a page within the guide. So for every stop, and there's 19 in the one hour, there's an image, an audio file, a title and a transcript, and the same for the Mandarin version. And then there was a separate version written for the, for the children's tour. There's a lot of content to produce. And actually one of the challenges we faced was content. So at the start of the project, uh, we um, worked with a company to write the content, and they were based in Australia, which was actually really challenging because the content was focused on specific Māori taonga at our museum. Um, and really our curators, CNI developers and writers were best placed to write and produce this content. So fortunately our team did end up doing that. Um, which was the right decision in the end, but it was a real shame that we didn't make this decision early on because it would have um, saved us a lot of time and a key learning here is more consultation with key stakeholders early in the project to make sure these decisions are being made right early on. Um, and we commissioned Anna Coddington, who's a New Zealand singer-songwriter, to record the audio for the English guides. So take a listen. <laughs> No mai haere mai. Welcome to the Māori Court. Here you can discover the richness of Māori culture through stunning taonga or treasures. From magnificently carved houses to intricately woven cloaks to beautifully crafted jewellery and the tools needed for everyday life. So let's get started. Then of course there's in-gallery signage. So we work closely with our in-house design and production team to create and place the signage for each of the stops, and some of those were relatively simple. Others had to be on the outside of the case, and on this case, one on, on a plinth in front of the pātaka. And one of the difficulties and challenges that we faced was that after the audio guide launched, we were made aware that one of the objects in the gallery had come off display. Not this one, obviously. Um, it was stop 15. And so unfortunately we found out after the object had been removed from the gallery, so there was a bit of a scramble to update all six guides. Uh, and it wasn't as simple as just removing a stop, as each stop includes audio that leads you on to the next one. So here's Guy. Hey, Guy. Um, he's our digital experience manager. So he performed some magic to update both the English and Mandarin guides. And you can see now stop 15 is sitting at his desk. Um, but what it means now, though, for us is that the hour-long guide that includes all the stops, 1 through 19, now goes from 14 to 16, which isn't ideal. Um, but it still works, and it's another learning for us. So for guides that include objects within permanent galleries, what's your plan if one stop um, has to be changed or removed? So the app needs to be updated, and the audio may need to be as well, um, especially if that audio leads you on to the next stop. All right, let's take a look at what we actually discovered at the end of the pilot. 
So firstly, a note about the evaluation. It was, it was pretty tricky. We have a great visitor marketer visitor market research team and we work really closely with them but we early on we realised we couldn't do any face to face research as we didn't know when people would actually be using the guides and we couldn't have somebody standing in the gallery all day waiting. So we decided um, to run surveys also in English and Mandarin and these formed the basis of the evaluation along with the analytics that we had running on the app as well. So over the four-month period, we had just over 700 users. And of those, about two-thirds used the English guide and a third Mandarin. And we received about 60 survey responses, so not a huge amount, but it was enough to get a sense of what visitors thought. And two-thirds of users were international visitors and they were primarily from the USA, UK, China, uh, Germany and Canada. And the uptake from Aucklanders was also strong, which was interesting. So how did, how did they actually use the guide? Well, not surprisingly, most people used it alone and they used their own headphones. And really only a really small percentage actually purchased headphones. In terms of which guides were the most popular, well, interestingly, there's discrepancy between the um, survey responses and what our analytics are telling us. So our survey responses are telling us that the adult 60-minute guide is by far the most popular. But Google Analytics is telling us something different. So it's telling us that there's a really close split between the 60-minute and 30-minute for the adult guide. So this is likely to be askew based on the um, small sample size of survey responses. And so what we're going to do is we have an um, analytics dashboard that we're creating um, so that we can get deeper insights on an ongoing basis. But one thing that both of these make really clear is that the children's guide has really low usage and is not really being used much at all. So we're going to retire that version. So, and then in terms of the um, qualitative feedback from visitors, it's been great, but you know, maybe that's because you get more engagement from you know, people who um, actually enjoy an experience who want to let you know that when they um, complete a survey. Um, so 90% said it made their experience more positive, they felt it was a unique experience, it was really easy to use, and they were extremely or very satisfied with the guide. They felt the content was interesting, it focused on the right stories, and it had enough information. And unsurprisingly, most people said it should be included free of charge with the ticket price. Um, they did tell us that they'd like more audio guides for other parts of the museum, so that's good. And some areas for improvement, uh, we need to make it easier for people to actually get the guide. So we need to improve um, our marketing for when people arrive at the museum. They need clearer instructions on actually how to use it. The Wi-Fi dropped off for a few people. We need to slow down the Tereo narration and we need to provide English translation for some of those words. And we need to help people find the stops better. So good old stop 15 that's not there. <laughs> it's now in our office, so. We need to fix that. So the pilot really has given us great insights and feedback from visitors. Uh, we're going to make changes to the Heitaunga Māori guide to make it better. We'll remove the children's version. We'll do research with our visitors to find out what other guides they would like to experience. And after that, we'll do more. Thanks. Questions for Kelly? 
think this is the first session I've ever chaired in my life where we're well ahead of time. It's fantastic. <laughs> So, uh, my question is to the Biden Commission on the Earth. Uh, that decision was made before I started. Um, I think it was identified that um, we wanted to capture tourists and see really what the uptake was from that market coming into the museum and that audience. It's certainly something that we're going to consider um, for the next round. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the kids tour stuff, kind of interesting because um, my, I went, went on a school visit with my kids to the museum yeah. and it just, none of that kind of, and we went into the Marae there, but there's none of the interpretation stuff is kind of included. Is it possible to repurpose that content as part of school visits to increase the use? Yeah, potentially. I, I thought that would be a good... Um, yeah, I felt there was something kind of missing from the, the kids Yes, visit. I mean, we have that content. Part of the decision to retire... Um, those guides is based around the fact that the low uh, the usage is low, which you would ex you know you would kind of expect anyway. However, to maintain and manage those and update those on an ongoing basis, we just feel is not worth the effort. There's too much else to do, and we also are looking at what other experiences we can create for children um, that are more engaging um, rather than being talked to. So something a bit more playful. Um, that they can ex explore around the museum. I was wondering if a mobile charging station would increase usage of the app and perhaps headphone splitters at the shop. Would that help the sociability aspect? Yes, potentially. And it's something that when we do our research in VMR and ask visitors, we'll certainly include those types of questions within that. Yeah. Um, over the... Did you say two months, the period? Four months. Four months, oh yeah. Um, um, and I, th I was just wondering what was the, um, or if roughly you know what the monthly visitation to the museum is um, over the time? I'm just trying to get a co kind of a conversion rate. Uh, it's about 100,000 a year. A year, it? okay, thanks. A month, sorry. A month. A month, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I just wondered what was, um, if you can in a sentence, tell us what was your main um, impediment to making progress more quickly? You mentioned 14 months for production. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Too hard? Um, Chatham House rules. <laughs> it was, it was, it was a lack of consultation really on with key stakeholders and making sure that we were making the right decisions about who's producing the content and getting people lined up to do it. Um, and really good project management is key. Yeah. Hi, Kelly. Hi. I just wondered, for each stop, was there an average sort of time that you wanted the voiceover to be, or did it vary depending on the object she was describing? It did. Uh, we didn't want each stop to be too long, but one of the things that we did find at the end was that for certain objects, people wanted more time to stop and um, maybe listen again to the audio. So there's a couple of stops, I think, that we need to adjust the timing and slow it right down. Yeah, and th th that was actually one of the um, key pieces of feedback from the children's guide, is that they found the pace of that content too fast, too quick. Kia ora. just following on from Amos's question, did you um, actually calculate that conversion, i.e. the you know, proportion of your overall visitor numbers who picked up the guide? Um, we, we actually haven't pushed it. So in terms of marketing it to visitors, because it was a pilot, we really wanted to keep it quite low key. So that conversion rate's not really high. 
but actually because we didn't push it a lot, we, you know, in a lot of other museums they have stands. Um, it's really obvious when you when you go there that this is a really key part of the experience. We haven't done that. It's actually quite hidden. Um, so because we've seen that it's successful and it's working, and visitors like the content, we want to make tweaks. We want to make it better, and then we're actually going to look at that in um, in on the floor signage so that when people arrive they can see and then it'll be really interesting to see if there's you know much more of an uptake and what those conversion rates are. Elder. Cool. Right. Okay. Kia ora. Thank you.